Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah. So we're going to begin just in a few minutes, but in the meantime, um, we'll take a moment just to make a general introduction. So when one begins any text, one keeps, one makes one's purpose and intention clear at any time. And that's one of the important things for the believer. Next week, we'll touch upon a little more on this when they talk about the 10 investigations. Right? The 10 investigations. There's 10 things, but it's a bit intense. So I, I figured we'll take that second class, not the first. Is that the ulama tell us that before one begins anything of significance, the believer should have certain things very clear. Right? And these return, in essence, to four things. There are four things that one should always ask about anything in life, in general. What is it? What? Why? How? And then when? These are, they, you know, they, they call this in the intellectual tradition, the four fundamental questions. They're kind of obvious, but it's surprising how many things we don't ask these four questions about, which are, what is it? Why? Right? So about something one's choosing to do or not, why do I do it? Number three, how? Like, for example, how do I benefit? How do I do it correctly? There's a number of how questions. And then when? Because some book may be great, but this may not be the book to study here and now. It may not be the book to study here and now. One example being, you see the greatest and largest tafsir book ever. It's wonderful. But when do I study it? And you will, you know, in most classical study, they'll say you study short works first, then mid-sized works, then the larger works. Not because you're incapable, but because that's how you can best benefit from study. You begin with the small, and then you go gradually towards large amounts of knowledge. Why? In order to be able to maximize your benefit. So similarly, anything that one does, one asks what, why, how, and when. And this applies, of course, to study. Right? What am I studying? But also, why am I studying this? And one, there's a theoretical why, that what's the benefit of the science, but then also, one of the why questions that one asks is, what is my intention in studying this subject? And there is a clear intention why one studies the Arabic language. Because one of the things from the get-go, the studying Arabic is not meant to be exciting. But the believer looks at, judges things by their fruits. If someone says, what is gardening? It's getting your fingers dirty, getting soil in your nails, and smelling like fertilizer. It's not. Gardening is about, well, the process, some people find it enjoyable, but one also considers that all of this, there are outcomes that one seeks from it. Outcomes that one seeks from it. And making the outcomes makes many things make sense. I just love fertilizer. Okay? So if you use natural fertilizer, it's not the most exciting things. Of course, I, I feel guilty using the example of gardening because I always thought gardening was not the greatest thing to do. Because you could just go buy the thing from the, from the supermarket. Now, of course, some people enjoy gardening and find it meaningful and fulfilling and many other things. I find meaning and fulfillment in opening a book. But different people are created different. So once that's a general perspective by which the believer should do anything. Even if you study something of spirituality, someone speaking about repentance. You always ask yourself these four questions. What is repentance? Why is it important? How do I repent? And when? And on many questions, the, the 
Answer to when? Maybe immediately. Of things that you have to do, you do it immediately. Some things you don't actually have to do, then the time may not be now. Right? The time may not be now. You, Some new book has come out. You might even buy it, but now might not be the time to study it because it's a rare book, but you'll study it later because you have a priority. So this is one of the things that we strive to cultivate as believers, to be thoughtful and purposeful. Knowing background about a subject helps, and we'll be taking that today. The intention is a critical matter. The intention, when one approaches any subject and anything in life, is very important. Because the Prophet ﷺ tells us that truly actions are by their intentions. Truly actions are by their intentions. The first hadith that a lot of the hadith works begin with. Truly actions are by intentions. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى And truly each person shall have whatsoever they intended. So what is the intention for learning the Arabic language? To understand the Qur'an. Okay. Okay. I'll hold that for a second. Good answer. Uh, those of you who are online are welcome to participate as well. Why would you learn Arabic? First, I like to just go ahead. Bismillah. Brother Hamza, go ahead. Yeah, to understand, you know, the um, primary texts of Islam, of Islam, the Quran, the Hadith, you know, the sciences of Islam. Now, there is a trick to intention. It was pointed to by one of the, the sisters, uh, which I didn't quote her answer, which is the intention at one level is deceptively simple, yet excruciatingly difficult, which is, what is the intention in anything? Ultimately, there is only one intention that really counts, which is, لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ For the sake of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى The intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to have is the sincere intention. The sincere intention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Lillahi ad-deenul khalis. Allah's alone is pure religion. Allah's alone, meaning pure religion, true religion is for the sake of Allah alone. They've, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Bayan, they've not been commanded except that they be devoted to Allah, making their religion, making their religious acts sincerely for His sake. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ This is the 98th surah, verse 5. They've not been commanded except that they worship Allah, that they be devoted to Allah, making their acts of devotion sincere for the sake of Allah. What is sincerity? Sincerity is, why am I doing this? For the sake of Allah. And then, there are many other good intentions. A number of you mentioned to be able to understand the Qur'an, to be able to understand the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, to be able to understand the great classical texts of Islam, to be able to understand when people speak Arabic, or to be able to speak in Arabic oneself, to be able to read Arabic, to be able to write Arabic, particularly when it comes to grammar, and we'll see the fruits of Arabic grammar. So this is a noble intention, but the intention is made at the beginning, like for a lengthy journey, for a lengthy journey, you begin with the purpose, but 
you also have to remind yourself of the purpose throughout. Because for a lot of people, you know, physical journeys are a little bit easy. You're going on the Appalachian Trail. We're Canadian. You know what the Appalachian Trail is? Anybody? The Appalachian Trail. Any Americans here? So the Appalachian Trail is one of the longest trails, at least in, in the U.S. I don't know if Canada has, a, has longer trails. We've got a big, empty country, but um, we may have a longer trail. But it's a long trail, basically. That's like a simple definition. A long trail, largely on the East Coast, through the Appalachians and elsewhere. So on a... Of course, even the Appalachian Trail, many people start it. Most don't finish. What happens? They lose their purpose. Why am I doing this? Like a lot of people, it seems cool. But once you're sleeping in the cold, the rain's leaking through your tent, you forgot, you, you left your blanket somewhere because you hung it up to dry, and then you didn't pack it up, at some point, it doesn't make sense anymore. Why? Because the purpose wasn't clear from the get-go. But with tangible acts, there is a tangible goal. I want to get the, to the end of such and such thing. The danger in the non-tangible, such as studying a text, etc., it's very easy to lose your sense of purpose. Why am I doing this? Most of the time, we don't physically lose the purpose. Sometimes we do, that I'm no longer attending class. But when the purpose is not clear, then the steps taken to fulfill that purpose don't really make a lot of sense anymore. So we stop. So the scholars tell us that if you look at prophetic teachings, you should renew your intention at every stage in the journey. You renew your purpose at every stage in the journey. We learn this, of course, from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We are believers. But what do we do each morning? The dhikrs we recite in the morning renew our commitment to faith. Allahumma inni asbahtu ushiduka wa ushidu hamalat arshika wa malaikata wa malaikataka wa jami'a khalqik. Allah bear witness to you by you and by your, by the, Angels who, who bear your throne, and I bear witness by all your creation that you are Allah, wahdaka la sharika lak, alone without partner, and that Muhammad is his servant, his messenger. You already believe all that, but you renew that commitment. Why? To keep that reality of faith alive in your heart. Now, the same thing applies to other things. You want to complete something, begin with a clear intent and purpose. Why am I doing this? And then number two, consistently, every time you begin any part of the action, renew your intention. When would you renew your intention? One is before the class. If you prepare for the class, renew your intention. After class, you want to review. Each time, each stage of the journey, bring to mind your intention. Initially, it takes a little bit of effort. It's like cycling. Initially, it takes a bit of effort. Did you ever learn to cycle? Did you fall much? Yeah. I used to fall a lot in the beginning. Because I'm like I'm a daydreamer. So I'd take the right step, I'd forget about taking the life's left step, because I'd be thinking about lunch or breakfast or something or the other. So, but then it becomes second nature, making intentions. So this is something very, very important. When you find weakness of resolve, what do you have to do? You have to renew your intentions. You have to renew your intentions. So this is one of the aspects. Also, you just have to know that Arabic is challenging. It's not difficult. Well, it depends. Many people find it difficult. But... You have to keep the fruits of it very clear. Now, we don't promise you any gimmicks. The role of this class is to cover Arabic grammar. 
broadly, Arabic can be broken down into three components. There is, the, is there's grammar, then there is comprehension, and there is expression. So the grammar is a framework. The comprehension, and that's what most sec programs for learning Arabic as a second language give you. They give you comprehension, and they might give you a few rules of grammar here and there. And, but they folk, comprehension comes from building your vocabulary, learning common expressions, common se sentence structures, also learning how to, listening, and the other skills. Expression is writing and speaking. But you can break these down. There are different pathways to learning Arabic. There are different pathways to learning Arabic. Some people are exceedingly practical. They like, just tell me, what do I need to say? And most modern language focuses on the practical. That's why you know apps like Duolingo and all these kinds of things, most of it is you learn through expression, which is actually number... Either number three, expression. From expression, you get comprehension, or you focus on two and three. And the grammar is only needed insofar as you're going to understand what is being said or what you're going to say. And that is a tempting way to approach language. But in the tradition of, his, you know, of Islamic scholarship, and we have 1,400 years of history to back this up, the ulama across the lands found it tremendously useful to put significant emphasis even at the begin beginning or near the beginning when, when learning Arabic on the grammar, particularly because of the nature of the Arabic language. We're talking about classical Arabic because modern Arabic has been Europeanized. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, may Allah protect and preserve him, mentions once he took a newspaper article, like a newspaper cutting, to his teacher, Murabit al Hajj, in the desert, and he read it to him. And if you ever heard Sheikh Hamza Yusuf speak in Arabic, he is supremely eloquent. When he finished, Murabit al Hajj asked Sheikh Hamza, Hamza, what language is that in? And Murabit al Hajj, his teacher, you can Google for his biographical info, Sheikh Hamza wrote an article when his teacher passed away. It's exceedingly beautiful. He's got, he's written commentaries on short works in grammar, like what we're going to be studying, the Ajrumiya, and also on one of the largest study texts in grammar, the Alfiya of Ibn Malik. So Sheikh Hamza said, it's in Arabic. Murabit al Had said, Hamza, this is not any Arabic that we know. Like he couldn't recognize modern Arabic because the sentence structures, etc., are basically taken from French, from English, etc., journalistic um, language, which is this mush that actually doesn't make a lot of logical sense even in English. Um, like a lot of what we say day to day, it's amazing. That may means nothing. Right? Or just reduce it to wow. Right? That's not. That's reducing us to an easy consuming animal, not into a rational animal. Okay? So if we don't learn anything else, is that you know, Arabic teaches us to be precise. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, actually Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab actually said, learn Arabic. Because it will increase you in dignity and in intellect. Because the nature of Arabic is that it expresses things in beautiful ways. So you will speak in dignified ways. But also, it'll, it'll increase you in intellect. And we'll see some of the characteristics of the Arabic language as we go through. Because it is, it's a purposeful language. Arabic has many marvels amongst them. That Arabic is such a nuanced language that 
the ulama of the first few centuries debated, are there synonyms in Arabic? Or does every word have a unique meaning? And a little bit of its semantics that, that every word has a distinct range of meanings, but many have sufficient overlap to be considered generally synonymous. But that's why the expressions in the Quran, the words used, when they're used, they're similar words. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word sirat for path versus tariq or versus sabil versus minhaj, each of them has versus other words for path, each one has a distinct meaning. There's different words for morning, for night, etc. Each conveys a different range of meanings. So this course, of course, focuses on the grammar. This gives us a framework of understanding. This gives us a framework. But it helps to complement these two skill areas together, the grammar with comprehension, working on comprehension. You can work on comprehension in a number of ways. One of them is by taking... Really, you know, while studying the grammar, taking courses, taking a course, and we have our learning Arabic program at Seeker's Guidance, taking a course on, you know, the, the on practical Arabic. That's what most learning Arabic programs, like the one we have at Seeker's, cover. If you have some background in Arabic, to do some reading on your own. There's different texts that help with that, so you can be picking up vocabulary and expressions and so on. That is the comprehension aspect. And generally, it's best not to try to do everything all at once. You get these two areas down, your essential grammar, your essential comprehension, before you bother too much about writing stuff, even speaking. Although some people think that speaking is a major help to understanding, right? but in the beginning, you narrow it. The other thing that practically helps is that focus your vocabulary as much as you can. Right? Especially if you're if you're here for stuff, something like diplomatic Arabic or you want to know how to order things when you go to the Arab world, the pro tip with ordering things when you go to the Arab world is speak in English. <laughs> it's sad and you know I love the Arabic language, but you ought to get your way in the Arab world. You know, button up, walk straight, speak in English. It's sad. I was stuck in the airport in Abu Dhabi. There's no internet. And I live online. I was there for 10 hours and I needed the internet. I had, I had just approved nearly 100 questions for the answer service over several hours. And I need to send them. And I was on a 15-hour flight, going to be on a 15-hour flight to Sydney, Australia. So I buttoned up my jacket, walked straight. And with full confidence, asked at the hotel, excuse me, um, can I use the business lounge, please? They escorted me to the business lounge. <laughs> so something that, you know, it worked. If I said the same thing in Arabic, they would have ignored me. Um, it's sad. But so it's good to narrow because some people get creative ideas. They like soccer, so they... Um, they said, okay, I'm going to build, build up my Arabic vocabulary by following um, the you know, following what Ronaldo is up to in Saudi by reading Saud the Saudi press. That language, or I like politics and current affairs, so I'm going to follow Al Jazeera or whatever channel. I'm not a fan of Al Jazeera, but this, but that, that vocabulary, those sentence structures are not the vocabulary and sentence structures of the Qur'an, of the Sunnah, of the Islamic tradition. Of course, it's broadly the same language, but it's not what you are looking for. Right? You're not, I mean, so that's something 
to keep in mind. Even children's storybooks, if you get children's storybooks, and if you have some Arabic, storybooks help, but be particular in finding out what are storybooks that use classical Arabic. Why? Because a lot of children's storybooks, sadly, are just translations of English. So you may think that, you know what, if I re read about Jack and Jill, I don't know if Jack and Jill is still published or is politically incorrect for some reason or the other. Do you read Jack and Jill growing up? Okay, whatever. See, I don't know if it was a series anyways, but some, you know, Peter and Jane, these kinds of Ladybird series, whatever. But you have to be careful because when they translate them, they translate them as is, including the sentence structure. So in Arabic, if you have... What are the types of jumla in Arabic? And there's two types of sentence in Arabic. There is, so there's basically two types of sentences, right? First is the jumla ismiya, what's called the nominal sentence. It has a subject and a predicate. For example, you say Zaydun qa'imun, Zayd standing. That's a nominal sentence. But if you say, قَامَ زَيْدٌ This is a verbal sentence. In a verbal sentence, the verb comes before the noun. You say, قَامَ زَيْدٌ Always. If you say, زَيْدٌ قَامَ This is actually a nominal sentence. And the qama has an implicit noun, which would be huwa. But you'd only say something like that. You say, instead of saying qama zaydun, right? Zayd stood, right? But you have to put the verb first in Arabic. If you switch it around, there is some rhetorical purpose. You're trying to make a point that only Zayd stood. You say Zaydun Qama. Or you want to tell someone who stood. You want to emphasize Zayd. We say it in day to day speech, in classical Arabic, you're just speaking wrong. But modern Arabic has flattened many of these things. Particularly modern spoken Arabic, modern diluted Arabic, as opposed to modern classical Arabic. So mo there, there's this Western construction called modern standard Arabic, which they teach it. A lot of universities. It's journalistic Arabic. It's diplomatic Arabic. It's, it's the, the language they want us to speak for the purposes of co colonization and economic um, control. But it's not classical Arabic. You pick up lots of that. You come to the Quran. You don't exactly know what's going on. So that's why grammar is quite is very important. Because ultimately we want to appreciate the depths and nuances of the Qur'an. Okay. So that's a little bit of background before we begin. Any questions here before we proceed? Bismillah. Okay. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله in our course on understanding Arabic grammar the Ajrumiya explained we are beginning today with lesson number one um, and when we begin of course this is the first step in what we call the mastering Arabic curriculum at Seekers Guidance so we begin with level one of Arabic grammar which when it comes to Nahu, it's the Ajrumiya. And we have courses, alhamdulillah, all the way till the mastery level. So level five. And we have specialization program in Arabic with Sheikh Ali Hani and other specialized teachers. However, there are certain very particular outcomes for this course itself. And the first outcome here is to appreciate the framework of Arabic grammar appreciate the framework of Arabic grammar. And what we mean by that is 
that firstly the language itself and the language right, Arabic is what the Arabs spoke there's a philosophical question which is very tempting but we won't go too much into it that what is the origin of the Arabic language and there is some relationship ultimately unknown between the part the primordial human language and Arabic and the Arabic spoken by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what exactly is that connection we don't know but the ulama tell us that what we understand from the Quran and from the Sunnah and also by a study of the, the Arabs is that Arabic is the primordial language there's no language that in the primordial framework of Arabic is older than Arabic as opposed to what modern Arabic is or even there are of course influences on Arabic even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there are words even in the Quran that are non-Arab words that came into Arabic in the Quran Sarabil, Zanjabil for example Sarawil there are words um, that came into Arabic a lot of them from Persian due to the trade routes but also it is said from elsewhere it is said that there are words from Indian languages in the Quran but most most likely they came in through Farsi that's a matter of controversy Indian scholars like claiming it but they claim many things in the Quran not all of them are true but to understand the free what how does this language work that's what the and what are the rules governing it they give you tools for understanding Arabic that's and we want to understand the overall general framework of the Arabic language right through understanding the grammar and secondly these give us tools to navigate through the Arabic language because there are common modes of expression in Arabic they are common modes of expression in Arabic and those are analyzed by Arabic grammar they also sometimes help us understand if we don't understand exactly the word of something but by knowing what kind of sentence it is it'll give you a sense from context for example what is it getting at something ended up on the table and someone went to the restaurant and now they came home just maybe the food right if you don't know what this means but at least it'll help if you have the tools of understanding and you look at context it'll approximate the understanding of course just open the dictionary right? so it get, helps us navigate through the Arabic language and then this theory we practice we bring it into practice in two ways right we bring it into practice in two ways one way is but how by understanding what is being said right in writing that will be our primary focus understand what is being said in writing so that we can identify and this is significant why because if you look at dua for example what are different expressions for saying for making istighfar right? how do you say how do you make istighfar you can say astaghfirullah that's a verbal sentence astaghfirullah right? it's in the mudari'ah right? it's in the present continuous i ever seek forgiveness I am seeking the forgiveness of my Lord right astaghfirullah okay, but you can also put it in the dua case which is a command Rabbi ghfirli, O Lord forgive me now that conveys different meanings astaghfirullah I seek Allah's forgiveness but Rabbi ghfirli, I mean in meaning but also this term Rabbi ighfirli how to understand that grammatically 
It's a complete statement. Actually, when we say Rabbi, we'll realize, when we say Rabbi, there is a word that is omitted, which is Ya Rabbi. Oh Lord, forgive me. It's so you're calling upon Allah and then asking him something. That conveys a different sense. But if you say, Tubtu ilallah wastaghfartuhu, I have repented to Allah. Tubtu ilallah is, what kind of verb is it? What kind of verb? It's madi. It's the past tense. Conveys a different meaning. In, not just in grammatical structure, but in real meaning. Because one can, can, contains, I am now seeking Allah's forgiveness. The other is, I am asking Allah's forgiveness. The other, I have repented and I have sought your forgiveness, O Lord. So it conveys different senses. Now if you look just at this one principle in your day-to-day -day dhikr. When we go to sleep, we say, Allahumma bismika amutu wa ahya. O Lord, by your name do I or ahya wa amut, come in both ways. By your name do I live and do I die? This is in the present and continuous sense, the mudari'a. But the Allahumma, O oh Allah, has significance too. But other things, that other dhikr that we say, or dua, or dua that we make, is not in a verbal sense, but... It's a nominal statement. We say, Alhamdulillah. What kind of sentence is this? What kind of sentence is this? Hmm? Yeah, it's a nominal sentence. A lot of dua is action based, it's verbal. But dhikr is nominal. Not always, but frequently. All praise. Alhamdu lillahi. Of course, there's something missing in the statement. Alhamdu kainun aw mustahiq lillah. All praise belongs to Allah, is deserved by Allah. It's a nominal statement. It's unrelated to time. It's, absolute, it's an absolute statement. All praise belongs to Allah. That conveys different meaning. It, it can't... Con, con, it's not connected with an action that is now or an action that happened or something that is ongoing. It has different shades of meaning. If you read the Quran and reflect, tasbih, glorifying Allah, has come in all three verbal senses in the Quran, past, present, future, past, present, and also the command. Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la. Glorify. Sabbaha lillahi. Ma fi samawati ma fi al-ard. Right? All that is in heaven and the earth has glorified God. In past tense. Yusabbihu lillahi. Ma fi samawati wa wal-ard. Right? There's... All that is in the heavens and the earth glorifies God. It has a different sense. And there's different meaning conveyed. Same word. Just a glorify God. But there are also فَسُبْحَانَ حِينَ تُمْسُونَ وَحِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ It has a different sense. So this is why in our reading our Quran, even in the prayer. The prayer is a mixture of nominal statements that we make and verbal statements that we make. And they convey fascinating meanings. Allahu Akbar, nominal statement. Allah is absolutely great. But then after that, what do we say after that? Okay. 
We say, what do you know? We make the opening dua. What is it? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. That's tricky. Okay. Because the subhanaka, we'll come to it, but there's something implicit. Usabbihuka subhanaka. Okay. It's a, a verbal sentence. But there's something omitted. But we never think about it because we just say it. I glorify you, so glorious are you, O Lord, with all praises. But then we say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That's another type of sentence. It's actually a verbal sentence. There's no verb explicitly in Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, but the verb is implicit. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Aqra. By the name of Allah, merciful and compassionate, do I write? Or do I recite if you're reciting the Quran? But then when you recite within the Quran itself, there's different kinds of things that come, but we say Allahu Akbar. But in Rukua we say Subhana Rabbi Al Azim. And Subhana, you know, you can think about which type of sentence it is, we'll take it. So there's this, and even just this one concept that we understand. A nominal sentence affirms a matter as absolutely true but the verbal sentence if in the past tense the jumla fi'liya that's in the madi refers to something that's happened but also that's the truth that it's done or the mudari'ah it's something i'm doing now or that's continual but dua which actually in the it's dua is like a command to someone above you, so it's called supplication. That expresses you're asking. So when Allah commands us, it conveys a meaning, and when we make dua to Allah, it conveys a meaning. So even appreciating the difference between the jumla ismi and the jumla fi'liya, unpack, especially if we ignore modern Arabic and its sort of flattening of everything. Just say whatever. But we focus on the, the framework of Arabic, you see. It has numerous usages practically. Ultimately, this is, you know, we're not trying to learn how to, how to get a diplomatic job with the United Nations. <laughs> there are probably better programs for that. But to appreciate the language of the Quran, the language of the Sunnah, um, you know, this is, this is what the purpose is. Um, in the first lesson, which we will introduce today and complete, there are a few key outcomes. Right? Firstly, we look at what's the definition of speech. By looking at what it, because speech takes place through sentences. Right? What in Arabic is called the jumla. That's a good insight even in English. Sometimes people just, it's not like you call talk, it's called like prattle. You just, bzzz, what happened today? Well, you know, they just start speaking. And if you're used to you know, teaching or used to just analyzing what people say and do, you ask them a question. They didn't stop to think even for a moment. So how could you have formulated any thoughts? Then at the end of it, you wonder, so what happened today? Because they just said a whole bunch of things, but none of it, they hope this whole bunch of things add up to something meaningful. No. Okay. So the building block of sound speech is the statement, the jumla. The jumla. And we'll see that and that has lessons in it just even practically in our lives right to be purposeful and that comes even in the definition of what is sound speech it's purposeful um, okay. and then we'll look that what are the building blocks of statements in arabic the understanding the categories of speech and you know the building blocks of speech in arabic are three Ism and fi'l and harf. We'll see that. 
الاسم nouns the فعل verbs and then the حرف particles and speech in Arabic is only made up of three types of words اسماء اسمس you know, verb um, nouns فعلس أفعال which are verbs and particles and Arabic has loads of particles and the particles are critical because they sort of they're like the tools that bring out meaning got a bowl of something amazing but you need different utensils to, to dig it out that's what the particles are they don't have meaning in themselves you got a bowl of soup you can't really use your your fingers for soup you need a spoon there's other things you need a fork for other things you need a knife for but arabic has these tools to bring out the meanings of other than themselves and you know the critical question in this that you know we try to explore in the opening is that why why is knowing grammar central to learning classical arabic and what would you say the answer to that is why is knowing grammar central to knowing classical arabic we try to introduce that a little earlier Why is knowing grammar central or important in knowing classical Arabic? You know, this, the sister has been answering the most question. Is not, you, you know, is actually quite shy <laughs> normally, but you know, she, alhamdulillah, she prepares and thoughtful. But so um, there's one. One of the questions, students online saying, meanings can be understood differently based on grammar. Right? That given the pre precision of classical Arabic, knowing grammar is key to understanding classical Arabic. Right? And we want to, language is there for understanding. So for one example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ now, yaksha, that Allah is only held in reverence amongst his servants by the people of knowledge. But this, the sentence structure, innama yaksha Allah, yaksha is what kind of, ver, what kind of word is it? Hmm? Yeah, but it's a fi'l, it's a verb, yaksha. Now, when you have a fi'l, what do you normally have after it? Right? You have fi'l, the verb, then the fa'il, then the doer, you know, then the subject, then you have the maf'ul, the object of the sentence. So the classical example, you say, Daraba Zaydun Amran. you know, hit. The verb comes first. So let's say it. Yeah, I cringe at bad English, including my own, but Hit Zaid Amr. Right? So Zaid hit Amr. Daraba Fi'l Zaid Fa'il Amran Maf'ul. So verb, subject, object. That's a normal structure. But what does the verse say? In Inna ma yaksha Allah. Inna yaksha Fi'l. Verb, Allah here, what is it? This Allah here is the object of the sentence, not the subject of the sentence. Because if you read it wrong, it would be, if you, if you were to read it wrong, and you make Allah the subject of the sentence, it would be Allah only fears amongst his servants, the scholars. Does Allah fear anyone? That's absurd. So that's blatantly obvious. But if you don't 
understand it correctly, you misinterpret what's being said. Now, why does God fear anybody? No, he doesn't. Right? But why is it put this way in Arabic for emphasis? For emphasis. And many other examples exist like that throughout the Quran. And even the um, hadith of the Prophet. Or, you know, one of the du'as you make when you finish eating food. What is it? Akala. So the dua that is recited after eating food is Akala Ta'amakumul Abraru. Right? Which we're trying to say, your food was eaten by the virtuous. Akala is what kind of verb? It's a fail. Fail Madi. Your food was eaten. Akala, but again, normal mode in Arabic is verb, subject, object. But here, akala, ta'amakum. Your food was eaten, right? So verb, object of the sentence, then the subject, al-abraru, by the virtuous. Why? Because the emphasis of the sentence is your food was eaten. And you're addressing the host. And it has the meaning of dua. But if you said, Akala ta'amukumul abrara, it means your food was eaten, your food ate the, 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 the righteous. And this actually happened to one of the Syrian scholars. He went to India to teach. And everything they served him had spices. He was feeling hot, they brought him lemonade. And what did lemonade have? Spices. So he couldn't drink the lemonade. And the food he couldn't eat. They said, okay, we'll bring you the dessert. It was fruit salad. And even the fruit salad had what we call a chaat masala. So he couldn't even eat that. And Syrians, you know, they consider food to be spicy if you put black pepper on it. Ooh, that's a bit spicy. Some Syrians at least. So... So there, there, the sheikh, when he made dua at the end, as a joke, because amongst people of knowledge, he made the dua, Akala ta'amukum al abrar, your food ate up the righteous. So because the food was so spicy. So it's a nerdy joke, but that's the danger of that's why grammar is very important in the Quran, but also in various hadiths of the Prophet. Um, so that is the issue of the importance of knowing grammar because we it helps us properly understand Arabic. There's a structure to studying Arabic grammar. Broadly, you study Arabic grammar in three steps. You begin by short texts. And this is the starting point, the ajrumiya itself. That's the first step. We, we also recommend with that consolidating understanding of Arabic grammar by studying after the Ajrumiya, the, its commentary. And we have that available as a course. It's called a tuhfatu saniya It's a level two course in the Arabic curriculum. And we covered it previously. Some people, if you're keen on intensive study, whatever, some people may do both at the same time if you have the energy and resolve and drive and whatever. But... The default is you do one thing at a time. Some people like working hard. Um, then there's a text that's sort of between beginner and intermediate, and that's called Mutamimatul Ajrumiya. It covers Arabic grammar in about 40 classes, but much more heavy. It's about three times the detail level of this class. Then after that, the next step is the intermediate step. The intermediate step. So the beginner step is to know the general rules, how things work. The intermediate step is to understand why things are the way they are. Right? And to deepen one's understanding, to appreciate classical Arabic poetry, etc. And there, typically, 
Certainly in the Arab curriculum, there are two books, Sharh Qatr Nada and Sharh Shudur Zahab. The slides are available in the, in the course. You can just take those the names down from there. And then, then there's the advanced level. The advanced level, generally they study one or two commentaries on the Alfiya of Ibn Malik. Either Ibn Atil's commentary or Ibn Hisham's commentary. And really, Ibn Hisham was, his great, was a great scholar who wrote many valuable teaching texts. Maybe 8th century or so. And it becomes a standard form of part of the curriculum. And this is the Arab curriculum. The Persians and Indians and Turks and Kurds kind of make fun of this curriculum. That it's a little too complicated. That, sorry, it's a little too simple. Um, because the Persians, historically, the Persians and Turks and Kurds and Indians and others, their curriculum is a lot more structured, a lot more nuanced, but they cover a lot more of the philosophy of the Arabic language. So if you find this difficult, study the Persian, the, the Persian curriculum of studying Arabic or the classical Indian, not the modern curriculum, has been watered down. But this is what the Arabs study. And, um, and there, but there are different pathways. But the basic concept of traditional learning is you begin with short amounts of knowledge, you consolidate your understanding before moving to large amounts of knowledge. Then we can summarize the issue of why we study Arabic one way by looking at what are the fruits of the study of Arabic. And basically, the ulama give us a definition of what call, they call thamaratul lugha. Right? In, in any subject, to appreciate a subject, what are its fruits? In anything, what are its fruits? What's the benefit of doing this? And the classical definition of the fruits of Arabic are that the science of Arabic grammar, Nahu is ilmun tahfadu muraatuhu al lisana an il khata ifil kalami wa fahmihi. That Arabic grammar is a science which, if upheld, protects the tongue from errors in speech and the mind from errors in understanding. That is the purpose of Arabic grammar. Right? It's the knowledge of principles which, if upheld, protect the tongue from speech and protect the mind from errors in understanding. And that's the means for sound understanding of the Quran, the Sunnah, the Islamic tradition, but also Arabic is a living language, whether it be in the circles of knowledge or in the streets and marketplaces, though good luck with using classical Arabic in modern contexts because um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf mentioned many years ago that the student who'd gone to North Africa, and he was basically all the time in the madrasa. Once he came out from the madrasa, and he took a taxi, and he had the route, this is way before GPS or anything, okay? so he had the route mapped out, okay? old style, go down this road, turn left, then do this, then do this, and you know, the whole descriptive way of giving the address. When he finished, the taxi driver says, Sadaqallahu al-Azim, and he wiped his face, because he thought, that the student knowledge had been reciting the Quran or something, speaking in proper classical Arabic. So be aware of that. Sometimes you have to deliberately break your Arabic a little bit just so that you can follow day-to-day -day rules. And one of the practical tips is Arabs can do whatever they want with their language and butcher it completely. They consider it their right. And as much as a philosophical problem you may have with them butchering the language that's not theirs, it's Allah's, it's the Prophet's 
but you make the slightest error in usage, they'll hold it against you. And they'll hold it against you even if what you're saying is correct, but that's not how they speak. Right? And we'll share some of the tips. Like, don't use the dual in modern Arabic. Because modern Arabs don't use the dual properly in most cases. They'll butcher it. If you butcher it, they'll hold it against you. If you say it correctly, they'll say you sound weird. So just go against, you know, just circumvent errors. Um, the other practical tip is that language is through expressions. So don't pick up words, pick up expressions. Listen to good Arabic. That's worth listening to. But pick up expressions. Like in, you know, we say good morning. We don't say good this day is. Or we don't say how good this day is. Someone says that to you, you say, what's that, right? Similarly, so pick up expressions. Like things we say, how are you? Imagine if someone said, said how is your state on this blessed day? <laughs> Where did you land from, right? So, is, so, so pick up expressions. The other thing, when you speak, speak slowly. Know what you're going to say, then say it. If you're in any context where you need to speak, practical thing to do is prepare in advance a little bit. You're going grocery shopping, make a list of things you're going to say. You're going to meet one of the scholars and you want to practice your Arabic, write it down. So that you fulfill the purpose of what is a sound statement. So this is meant to be a broad introduction to the class, inshallah. If you have attended in person but haven't registered, of course, registration is completely free. Go to the Seekers Guidance Canada page. This comes up on the Monday section of the class. You can register there. And by tomorrow morning, we're going to have the tech. I think they may have it on. You'll have access to the slides uh, lesson by lesson. So we're going to have them up a day before. So if you want to print them out or put them on your tablet or whatever, so you can follow along with the slides. So they'll be up number two. Um, we have the text in Arabic of the Ajrumiya. There's a function, there's a usable translation of it that you can take as well. And if you are a serious student, you will benefit by trying to memorize it. If you're a dedicated student of knowledge or something, the classical way to do things is you memorize. You memorize. Um, and it at least even if you're not going to use it, but you are, Arabic grammar, you're going to use it, um, is it sharpens the mind. If you're not so young anymore, using your mind helps you avoid being senile. Helps you become senile. Right? Some of you have teachers who are into their 80s. Did he still have full memory of the Quran? Yeah. Whereas most people say, after 60, your, your memory starts weakening. Right? So actively using your mind by memorizing, by retaining things, if that, that's the baseline benefit. But also, it helps you. also creates a discipline for study. It helps you create a discipline, a routine, etc. And those, that's useful in study, is useful in other things in life. Because the act of memorizing even as an adult, forces you to give some time to it, give some attention to it, to break it down, etc. And that helps. But in due time, inshallah. So, next class, we're going to start by beginning the text itself. We'll give a little bit of an introduction on the author, a little more about the text, but then we're going to complete the section on kalam, by the definition of, of kalam and you know, breaking up, you know, the understanding of the definition, the parts of kalam, that it's the ism, fi'l, and harf, and how each of these is known. How each of these is known, because how do you distinguish between a noun, a verb? And that also helps you parse a sentence. There's some expression. What exactly is that doing there? 
after the first question is is it a noun is it a verb or is it a particle how do you know those the the ism has signs that the author gives and we try to try to break it down right likewise the verb is known by certain things and we've tried to break them down for you and particles are known by the absence of signs so we're going to break that down um, and that's basically what we're going to be looking at in terms of the completion of the lesson that these are the signs of the three types of verb at the end of each section we're going to share a little bit about what is what's the spiritual significance of arabic grammar and this is something that from the earliest scholars they saw spiritual meaning in everything so we're going to st we're studying grammar but everything points to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right so even speech right being comprised of these parts for the believer we take reflection even from the apparently mundane nouns verbs etc We'll touch upon that just briefly because it reminds us that there's a higher purpose in all of this, which is directing our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any questions before we close? So a whole bunch of you are online on Facebook and YouTube, etc. Do register for the class. All classes at Seekers are completely free. We're not trying to get you to... If you want to become a monthly donor, ahlan wa sahlan. There's a lot we're trying to get done. However, the this gives you all the you know if you register you get access to the to the slides, the resources, lesson by lesson, the quizzes, etc. I mean we've not covered a lot today besides the, some some background and so on. And you know, the closing advice is begin with intentions. Right? Begin with intentions and renew your intentions. At Seeker's Guidance, we have a very useful resource. One of the great scholars of the last three centuries, Imam Abdullah Al-Haddad, he has the intentions for seeking knowledge. Those are very useful. In everything, one of my good friends, and when, when we met, you know, I was, we met in the first year I went to Damascus, and he'd gone to Damascus to seek knowledge from Jordan. So we met there, and then we spent several, several, seven years together in, in Amman. Now he's one of the senior hadith scholars of the Ummah, Sheikh Ahmed Snowbar. He used to have on top of his, on top of, you know, on his wall, in front of his computer, at his desk, later he got a computer, that I, I intend through through the study of the hadith of the messenger of Allah, he specialized in hadith, to seek the pleasure of Allah Most High alone, by, and he had multiple intentions. These are the expressions of how you want to seek the pleasure of Allah by what you're doing. So I said, why do you have that in front of you? He said, because we're supposed to keep our intentions in mind at all times. So I just put it right in front of me. That's just one of those things that we should bring into our lives and the same thing applies even if you know you do any random thing that you, whatever you do in life even work just put it on your desk before you start working carry an alert remember to make your intentions if it's, it's worth doing you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so someone's asking, where do I get a copy of the Ajrumiyyah? You can buy it online if you'd like, but the PDF of the text, these are resources in the next 24 hours. You, you'll have them in the course. We'll stop there. Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.